Aloha, and welcome to The Creative Life, a creative collaborative production between Austin, American Creativity Association, and Think Tech Hawaii. So today we're going to be talking about innovation and improvisation. And uh, in a few minutes, in a minute or so, I'll be introducing you to our guest. And uh, we'll see what we could do today in terms of discussing creative problem solving and improvisation. And uh, as our guest will tell us how we mash these together and uh, move forward with great creative leadership. So our guest for today is Doug Stevenson, and Doug comes to us from Chicago, Illinois. And uh, Doug has a, a, a very interesting background, and we're glad to have him with us today. So Doug has been have has 30 years of experience in marketing, design, and, and working with creative teams for many companies that we're quite familiar with, including Doors. So I don't, I don't know if he had samples from Doors, but um, he also has formal CPS training and uh, thousands of hours of design, facilitation, and ide ideation. And uh, he also runs, has a podcast that he does with his colleague and friend, Greg Fraley, and where they put together innovation and improvisation, and they coined a little cutesy term, innovization. So with that, Doug, uh, I think we'll, we'll also share with our viewers that uh, you also have a background in comedy, so we'll be counting on you to be quite funny. And uh, you were part of the Second City. And for our viewers that are not in the United States mainland, they may not be familiar with the Second City. So uh, perhaps you could tell us just a, 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 we could start out by you just sharing a little bit of uh, your brief experience, not your brief experience, but a brief summary of working with the Second City and some of the people that you worked with. So with that, Doug Stevenson, welcome to The Creative Life, and it is my pleasure, and uh, I'm excited to be with you today. Uh, thanks so much. Um, it's great to be here. Um, with regard to Second City, I mean, it's the uh, still the, the mecca of, uh, of improvisational uh, performance, and uh, it all began at uh, one of uh, Chicago's fabled institutions, the University of Chicago, where uh, a group of kids got together and they included Mike Nichols and Elaine May and Ed Asner and uh, Paul Sills and, uh, uh, you know, uh, many others uh, you'd recognize. And um, then they formed uh, this thing called the, the Compass Players, and that transformed into the Second City which was kind of the only show in town, the greatest show on earth uh, for many years. And since then, there have been many uh, imitators and offshoots of that. But uh, Second City is the uh, is, is an institution that's been around for quite some time and is sort of the, uh, the citadel of uh, improvisation in the world. As I understand it, you worked with uh, a number of people that we would be familiar, at least with their name, and probably have seen their performances on uh, various uh, media sources, such as uh, Paul Sills, Susan Messing. Oh, you studied with those. Uh, but uh, you had worked in the Second City with Steve Carell and Bonnie Hunt. Well, yeah. And sure. well, just to be clear, uh, well, I was uh, hanging around Second City for four, five, six years, um, I really launched into uh, a semi-career in improvisation because I was working at the Players Workshop of Second City oh. with Josephine Forsberg, who was uh, an apprentice to Viola Spolin, kind of the, the grand dame of improvisation. Mm -hmm. And Joe Forsberg was one of the uh, maybe second generation uh, troop members of the Compass Players in Second City, and she had her own school of um, of improvisation. And uh, boy, I tell you what, if you listen to uh, a tape of Viola doing her classes and Josephine Forsberg, uh, you 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 might not tell the difference. So she was she was key in my development, and um, so I what propelled me into this whole thing was. I was taking classes with Joe and I, on a lark, um, did an audition for Second City Children's Theater. And I had never been an actor before. 
This was my first improv class. And um, I had never auditioned for anything. And I went there and I got the lead in this play. And uh, and they said to me, well, Doug, um, we see you're not enrolled presently. And in order to be in this play, it sort of needed to be enrolled. So I, that's how I got more committed. And yes, I worked with people, a lot of people who worked at Second City. I did uh, a number of my friends, including Bonnie and uh, my friend John, who was in the cast with Steve Carell, and my friends Joe Liss and Kevin Crowley. Uh, they all performed on the main stage of Second City. So back in the day, I, I was older than these guys by about four or five years. So I actually had a a home and a mortgage. <laughs> so I couldn't I couldn't really lead the vagabond life of being on tour with Second City uh, at the paltry uh, compensation level that they were at. But I would go uh, on, on Saturdays sometimes and perform with my friends in the improv set, which they did after the show, after the sh late show on Saturday. And so, yes, my last appearance at Second City was with uh, my friends Kevin and John, and I think Joe, and Steve Carell was in the cast. And uh, was very complimentary to me. I think he was just really being nice. <laughs> but... <laughs> well, I, I'm pleased to have the the very uh, serious and sophisticated member of Second City, and that would be be you, Doug. I'm sure. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about innovation and improvisation. And uh, we'll, I'll start off by asking you to talk a little bit about your experience with creativity and innovation, and that would be. Uh, for us to talk a little bit about creative problem solving. Right. And I, I'll get to that in a second. I, first of all, I just think I just think I should emphasize that um, creativity is vitally important uh, in, in the, at the, the creative education foundation that hosts uh, the SIPSI, the annual conference on creativity. You know, they really, their philosophy is basically that creativity is as fundamental as the three R's, you know, and and uh, everyone, in fact, even more fundamental, that we all should learn how to solve problems more effectively. Um, anyway, as an early, as a young child, uh, I had an aptitude for art, um, but beyond that, I didn't get much encouragement. Uh, you know, and there are these studies that say that, oh, when you, you poll kindergartners, you know, 95% of them raise their hands, right? When you say, who's creative? And they're all going, ooh. And by the time they're 18, about 2% of the kids raise their hand. Um, which very, could lead, go ahead. I said that's very true. I which agree. could lead me to the next observation that might get us into CPS. And that is one of the parallels I drew between creative problem solving and uh, improvisation was that uh, sort of the figureheads of both disciplines, Viola Spolin in improv and Sid Parnes in CPS, had similar philosophies, and and, and I'll, I'll share them with you. Right. Viola, uh, one of Viola's quotes is, um, born knowing everything, and then you go to school. So that gets in line with the belief that somehow our institutions educationally kind of drum uh, our creativity out of our kids. And uh, I had the privilege in 2006 of interviewing Sid Parnes uh, personally, and he reminisced for two and a half hours. And one of the things he said is he delivered a, a, a summer camp for kids in creativity and at the end of it, and he got misty-eyed with this. He said, um, one of the kids said to, to him, you know, I figured you out. You started out as an adult and you grew up to be a kid. Okay. And <laughs> it was a great moment. And I, I guess the, the point here is that uh, we have so many blind spots going through our development in, in traditional society. And what we need to cultivate be a, with respect to creativity 
is the same kind of open-mindedness and playfulness we had as children. Yeah, and and I think when we we think about creativities, we realize that you can't be creative about nothing. And one of the reasons that we turn to some of these models, and you and I have a favorite, and that's what we're here to talk about today, uh, you have to be creative about something. And ultimately, as you're looking for that something, more often than not, that something is a problem. And that's the connection for us in, in dealing with creative problem solving and the reason it is called creative problem solving. So uh, w- with that in mind, how how did you get a... Well, let me just share. I think we both have the same feeling that we feel that the creative problem solving institute model uh, was life changing for both of us in different, sure. in different ways. And uh, many of the people, if I think back to my first experience, when people would come back from the Summer Institute, I would ask them what it was about. And no one could really tell me. All they could say was as if they just got an aura about them and just said, you have to experience it to know. Uh, what it what it was. So I think for those of us who have grown in creativity and stuck with it and uh, played around with it some more, as your term talking about mashing up creative problem solving and in, improv, uh, tell us a little bit about that mash. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I will. And I, I will say this, though, too, to kind of as a billboard, I would say <laughs> to your audience, if you have any doubts or reticence or you, know, you have any or especially if you have any uh, appetite and curiosity for this, mm-hmm. take a course in creativity. Take a take one improv class. It's been proven that if you do just one of those things, uh, your life will change. Believe me, uh, and 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 for the better. Um, I think the question was about CPS and how I got there. A little bit about that, but uh, really how the two, why why you've chosen to blend them and be one of the... Oh, okay. Well, um, that kind of sort of, so how I got to to this, the SIPSI and CEF and creativity is for the uh, a, a number of years of my life, people, I was kind of a, a late bloomer. I didn't realize I had creative aptitude. I was a jock in high school and I used to use my head as a blunt instrument. And, uh, I, I, uh, I, you know, you know, I could be funny around the edges and uh, I could be goofy, but you know, I never really took myself seriously as a creative person. And, um, I got involved in my career first in advertising at Leo Burnett and then in, uh, in three dimensional design and experiences at, uh, uh, Exhibit Group Gilsper, which is was in the design exhibit museum event space. And um everybody just kept saying, um, you know, I was dubbed Mr. Creativity at one of my jobs. And I, this was at the design firm. And we were going through some corporate turmoil at the time, uh, at one time, and I closed my door. I was always an open door kind of guy, but it it seemed like nothing but bad news was coming through the door for a while there. Pink memos and stuff. And when that happened, um, an interesting thing occurred. It seemed like every five minutes, there was a knock at my door and someone came into my office and said, Doug, we need some creative ideas. You got any? And about 10 or 10 or 15 sessions in, I thought to myself, you know, I'm in the wrong business. I should be selling creativity. And then I explored, explored, explored. I found my way to, to SIPSI and CEF. And there I learned the fundamentals of creative problem solving. And my past caught up to me. People realized, Oh, you're an improviser. Uh, And, uh, and some of them have begun to employ improvisation in their creative problem-solving practices, and they encouraged me to do the same. So then I realized that there were uh, astonishing parallels between CPS and improvisation. 
Am I going in the right direction here? You sure. You sure are. <laughs> so, for example, you know, in, in creative problem solving, is describe two kind of distinct phases, right? Uh, a divergent phase and a convergent phase. And when you, if you look at divergence, and there's basically four principles in the CPS model, but there's analogs in improv. And that is like CPS says, the first premise is deferred judgment. Well, in improvisation, it says, accept whatever initiation your partner gives you. So you don't judge, you just go with it. And CPS says, build on ideas. And improv says, oh yes, and. And CPS says, come up with wild ideas. And in improvisation, you go, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's heighten and explore that. Let's take that to the max. And CPS says, go for quantity of ideas. And in improvisation, it's like, and, 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 and. That's what builds a scene to it, uh, its climax. So incredible parallels there. And then... Um, in the convergent phase of it, uh, which is a little, a little bit more vague, but CPS says, well, be deliberate. So there's a deliberate aspect to that, on mindfulness around process. And then even improvisation has rules that you, you try not to violate. You don't deny something, for example. You don't negate. Uh, you don't, you know, th there are, are rules around improv as free and free form as it is. And it, in the convergence process of uh, CPS, you're always mindful of your objectives. And in improvisation, you want to, you want to make a good coherent scene. And one of the things you do is you make sure that you make your partner or your other players look good. Uh, in CPS, you always want to improve on ideas in improvisation, you want to expand and heighten. You want to say, oh, yeah, a Martian landed on my front lawn yesterday. And, oh, man, that spaceship was, like, amazing. And, and I think they had cable TV or something. Anyway, anyway uh, you just kind of go, uh, you just keep going. Um, CPS, you're affirmative. You're always talking positive pluses before. Uh, I mean, judgment's not in the process until the, the the very end of the conversion process. And in improv, you're always looking for agreement. And in CPS, they say, you know, consider novelty. One of my favorite uh, exercises in CPS is the get fired idea. Because if people are having a problem right. uh, getting to consider novelty, and I've done this with great results all the time, I just say, okay, think of the absolute worst ideas you can. The ones that would get you fired. And amazing what people come up with. And you go, well, wait a minute. If you twist that a little bit, that just might work. But one thing that comes to mind is the band The Grateful Dead allowed people to tape their music and give it away for free. That's counterintuitive. Right. But it built a franchise uh, and uh, a marketing behemoth uh, that, it, that persists to this day. Yeah, it certainly uh, sustained itself. Right, right. I, I like to remind our viewers that um, so often in organizations, there's there are some mistakes that are made in, in identifying a choice for for a way to proceed. And by that, I mean, I can't I can't tell you how many times I hear, uh, let's brainstorm. And it's assumed by the person that is in the position of authority that they're taking them through the creative process, whereas brainstorming is just one step of the creative process. And I, I think both of us would agree that it's important that we we select a model uh, for problem solving. And for me personally, not, not to uh, put in my bias here, but I, I think for many people that are watching, they would agree that the, the magic of the creative problem solving model coming out of the fathering of, of Sid Parnes and some other leaders at that time and coming out from actually a business model too, is the magic is that you're constantly going from the critical to the creative. So 
you're always, and it's structured to bring you back. You're going free flowing, you're going wild, you're, as you have pointed out, you're going crazy with ideas, but then you're going to pull back with some activities that discipline you to move forward. And then it keeps going in, in that manner. Wouldn't you agree? Well, absolutely. And the other critical piece, for, first of all, brainstorming, it, it, the way the model, the CPS model looks now is uh, clarification, ideation, development, implementation. And um, <laughs> brainstorming is but one aspect of it. It would probably be defined as the ideation stage. And th this is one of the things you see in these articles that are critical of brainstorming. And you hear uh, in common vernacular, oh, well, that was a waste of time. Yeah, we had a lot of ideas, but nothing happened. I mean, the key piece of creative problem solving is, you know, so you first you think and you and you frame the problem or the challenge, and then you have a lot of ideas around it, and then you refine the ideas. But the last step is implementation, an action plan that gets implemented. Um, and that's the a key piece that's often missing and why brainstorming is often miscast as a, you know, a kind of a, a frivolous exercise. And it's not. Uh, how, how do we apply what we do know um, about models and the models of our choice? Um, how, how do we apply what we've learned via these two disciplines, the disciplines being creative problem solving and uh, improv? Well, um, what we found out is that people caught up to me and they, they, they outed me and they realized I had an, an improvisational background. And truth be known, a lot of creative facilitators uh, had done some training in improvisation. And what was typically done in their, in their sessions was they, uh, in between the phases of CPS, they would do these warm-up exercises featuring improvisation to get people kind of loose and bonding and all this stuff. All good. But one of the things we realized is, wait a minute, these are parallel processes. And if you fuse them, they might even become more robust and dynamic. So we created the concept of innovization, a melding of innovation and, and improvisation where we would actually take improv games and CPS tools and, and, and fuse them together. So for one example is um, uh, there's a, there's a game in improv where you read from a book randomly, or you, you know, you just read a line from a book and then you improvise off of that. What we would do is we would take a post-it note from an ideation session and introduce that as a, a means of continuing the dialogue. Or we would do this thing called story throw or direct a story where five or six players in improv would be up on stage. There'd be a director and each of the people would represent a different POV like uh, movie genres or angry, sad, whatever. Well, the same thing can be applied to um, stakeholders in a corporation or organization. It could be research and development, and manufacturing, and marketing, and or whatever. Or it could be customers, you know, loyal customers, you know, customers who aren't so loyal, customers <laughs> who have walked away. And you could direct a story. One of the wonderful things about improvisation is that it's it's really CPS in flow. When Alex Osborne developed uh, his, his concepts that are articulated in Applied Imagination, he was seeking to find out what were the critical element, elements of creativity so that he could enhance the performance of his creative people, but also take these same fundamental skills to people who weren't necessarily naturally in that mode, creative. And um, in my analysis, uh, then CPS is sort of like a outline, a diagram of what the process looks like. It's the skeletal structure. Improvisation is that same model in flow. And when you meld the two, 
you get the discipline of the structure, but you also get the fluency and the kind of intuitive discovery of improvisation. So people come up with things in, improvis in an improvisational mode that they never might have said that in, in, you know, uh, in a session. For example, if there was a management problem, they might be reluctant to say on a post-it note, there is a management problem. <laughs> but if you if you kind of uh, recreate the dynamics of the organization, which we've done, and you assign people roles like you're the boss, you're this manager, this manager, and with the facilitation of the facilitators, the guides on the side, amazing things come out of people's mouths. They kind of say the truth without without the judgment uh, around it. And so it can be, like I, I think I said to you the other day, um, improvisation is sort of like the WD-40 of creative process. It just it greases the wheels and makes it more, more natural and organic and leads to greater discovery faster. I can I can see how that could happen. Uh, I can also see how uh, people might, might, there are people, some people might be by by pure nature shy or not wanting to, reluctant to participate in anything that reeks of improvisation. How do you deal with those folks? Or do well, you see them? Well, here's the amazing thing. Well, first of all, for most people, let's be honest, to go into a room and do just CPS, to go through that process, mm -hmm. is a step out of their comfort zone. Probably. But it's, I'm sorry? I probably, yes. And, But it's amazing if you have two facilitators in the room who are giving them security and create a safe place for this. It is amazing. We've done this with novices who performed improvisation like they were pros because they were just going to a natural place of intuition and instinctive behaviors and recreating how, how things were uh, without inhibition. So, I mean, I'm not saying that there's a magic wand here that in all cases that this happens, but it happens with surprising regularity. Uh you mentioned something to me about agility shifting. Could you tell us, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I won't, I won't pretend to be an expert, but one of my early mentors uh, who you should should meet uh, is a woman by the name of Pamela Meyer, who's uh, here in Chicago. And um, I uh, work with her and ta taught with her at DePaul, where she used to, I believe she still does teach. Uh, she's since gone on to do a PhD and she's her third book is coming out. Anyway, her whole approach to creativity was uh, improvisationally based. And her, her PhD was in uh, organizational improvisation. I, I didn't know such a thing existed. The early work on this uh, was around, they studied uh, jazz musicians as, and how they improvised uh, 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 in their playing and their work, and then selected um, uh, uh, paradigms and structures from that and applied it to organizations. So she has her PhD in that. But one of the challenges of uh, going to an organization and giving them uh, creative skills is typically, and you probably know this, uh, Darlene, uh, you go in, you do a three day session, you do a six week project or whatever, and it's all well and good. Even people are enthusiastic about it, but after that is done and the report is written, they revert to their old behaviors. True. One of the <laughs> wish for is that in what, in what ways might we create cultures of creativity or innovation where people are more instinctively and organically inquisitive and imp improvisational uh, out of that kind of grew this concept of uh, uh, agility and agility is really just talks to speaks to how organizations really need to react in real time, especially these days where change is rapid. I mean, 
it was a cliche even in our youth but now um i mean really it's one thing one day and one thing the other um and so organizations need to be uh able to react in real time to rapidly changing uh, events uh, the pandemic for example created a, a huge a huge example of this i mean people had to restructure their entire uh, entire organizations around uh, you know staffing personnel how they operated they had to uh, get online savvy et cetera et cetera and the companies that did that best were the ones who were the most flexible and so agility training comes mm -hmm. out of the concept in some ways of in, uh, organizational improvisation but it brings it down to the level of okay so then how do we train leadership and leadership teams to work cross-functionally and work more more in terms of exploration of what solutions they might find and less objectively focused uh from their siloed uh positions in the company well, Doug, we're, we're winding down here, and uh, I'm, I'm really glad. It feels like we're just starting to get things rolling in the discussion, and it's a very in interesting discussion for me, and I, I hope for our viewers. I would encourage our viewers to uh, visit your website and also to listen to your podcast because uh, they're very they're very practical and they're they're very interesting and they're very easy to listen to and very pleasant. So Doug, I thank you for being with us today. And My pleasure. To to our viewers, we thank you for joining us and I have been Dar I am and continue to be Darlene Boyd. I was your host today for today's um, show the cre in the series of the Creative Life and uh stay with us and we'll be back in 2 weeks with another exciting revolutionary, revealing life of someone that is living a creative life and also, or also uh, working with people to help them to promote their creativity. So until then, uh, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.